Well, good morning. Thank you all for having me back um, to the Boulder City Campus. I've enjoyed um, being here a couple times before, and I'm excited to be here this morning. I'm excited about the series um, that you guys have been walking through, This Is Us. Um, so this morning, we're going we're gonna to look um, a step further, and, and we'll explain this in just a moment. But um, So last week, you guys, you were talking about abiding, connecting, and sharing, and what that looks like in the life of a Jesus follower. So abiding in Christ personally and daily, connecting uh, with groups, both large and small, and then sharing in the mission locally and globally. So the question then becomes, um, how do we do that? How do, we, how do we abide and connect and share? What do those things look like? How do I develop those relationships? How do I develop that relationship with Christ, develop it more with others and with the world um, via missions? Um, what does that look like? And the answer is simply time. Time is the answer to becoming more like Jesus. Time is the answer to becoming a Jesus follower. Um, so I've been in Las Vegas now for... Uh, five months, five months in a, in a week, I guess, um, today. So uh, I, I've been in, I've tried to learn, you know, my way around town uh, a little bit. And, and I have somewhat. Uh, I know how to get from my house to the main Hope campus because I go there on a regular basis. And it's a straight shot, so it's easy. But then when I have to come somewhere else, for instance, this morning, um, because I doubt myself and second guess myself, I put the address to this campus in my, in my GPS, in my phone, so that I could get here. And I've been here um, I don't know, four or five times, even outside of on Sundays, come visit with Pastor Don. And so I, I, I still had to have something to give me, uh, just to, to ensure me that I was going the right direction. Uh, and in the same way, anytime I'm going somewhere where I don't know where I'm going, like much of you, you either put it in a GPS or your cell phone, or you have an old school paper map, maybe. If you were born before um, 1960, you use a paper map. So, but they're all options, right? So we have to have, so I say that to say this, um, what we're going to look at today is, uh, is a map. Uh, it's a GPS. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a way to show you how to get where you want to go. It's a navigation system. And there are four parts to it, God time, gather time, group time, and go time. And this can be your map. You want to figure out how to be um, more like Jesus? Find out what it means to be a Jesus follower? To really dive in deep and not just, not just put your toes in the water and test it out, but to really go in deep? Here's your road map. And so we're going to walk through that today. We're going to walk through the four parts. And I'm going to do the best I can to get in as much as I can about the four parts. But there are your four points today if you keep notes. Start at the top and go clockwise. God time, gather time, group time, go time. And we're just going to walk through them and see why those four are important, why that's a road map, and how it's biblical. Because it's very, very biblical. We're going to look at examples of how Jesus did each of these things in his life when he walked on the earth. So... I said time is the way that you do this because all of these things take time. They all have the word time in them. Time is something that you have to have, that you have to invest in order to develop any kind of relationship. Just like with your friends or even some of your family. You know, if you want to continue to grow in your relationship with them, continue to get to know them, what do you do? You have to spend time with them. It's impossible to not spend time with somebody, to not talk to somebody, to not have anything to do with their life, and grow in your relationship with them and get to know them more. It's really ignorant when you think about it like that. We all know that's not possible. Yet we say, well, you know what? I'm going to be a Jesus follower. But I'm really not willing to invest the time. It's the case for a lot of Jesus followers. A lot of people that want to be Jesus followers. It's the case for me in portions of my life. I've had other ways that I wanted to invest my time that I saw more important. So in the same way that there are three key relationships, the abide, connect, and share, so God, others, and missions, in the same way that there are those three key relationships, these are the four primary ways that we spend our time to develop those relationships. So let's start with God time. God time, number one, being time spent daily alone with the Father. Time spent daily alone in fellowship with God Almighty. Major Ian Thomas says it this way. The Christian life is nothing less than the life which he lived then, lived now by him in you. So for each of the four ways that we spend our time talking about developing this relationship, we're going to look at an example um, of where Jesus did it scripturally, a time in the life of Christ where he modeled it. And so to, to show you where he modeled God time, time, spending, uh, time spent rather in fellowship with God Almighty, with God the Father, is in Mark one thirty-five. 
And it says this, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went away to a secluded place and was praying there. The, the single act described in Mark 1 and 135 is an incredible reality. It's an incredible picture of what our lives should look like because everything that Jesus, the man, did, he did out of overflow of intimacy with the Father. Everything he did, he did after he spent time with God Almighty. So if Jesus needed time with the Father, if he needed that alone time with him, how much more must you and I need time with him, need to spend alone time with him? So what can we learn from Mark 135? Well, first thing we learn is that Jesus spent time with the Father. I want to point out a few things in this verse that, that are important. And the first is this. It was early in the morning when Jesus went. It's highlighted in yellow um, on all the screens in here. That's awesome. So it's, it's early in the morning Jesus spent time with the Father. And I'm not saying that this is the only time that you can spend time with the Father. Because it's not the only time. But I am going to say two things about it. Number one, it was the pattern of Jesus' life. Jesus did it early in the morning. I can't tell you exactly why. I don't know if it had any significance, but that's what he did, so that's, that's what I want to do, but it's up to you, right? So it's not the only time, but he did it early in the morning, and I need to be sure that I'm prioritizing my time with God, that I'm giving him off the top and not the leftover, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus gave him his first fruits in the morning, his first time in the morning. He fixed his heart on God in the morning. We must learn to fix our hearts on God each day as well. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. It says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? There's a quote that I want to read you from Clyde Cranford um, that really sums up. It's, it's a great way to look at this. It's a great way, a summary of Jeremiah 17, 9. It says this, If we do not fix our hearts on God in the morning, they will fix on the first thing that comes along. When temptation comes, our hearts will fix on that, and we will sin. Or when an opportunity comes along that may not be God's will, our hearts will fix on that opportunity. Then if we go to God at all, we will go not for guidance, but for permission. And there's a vast difference between the two. So what do you do in the morning? What do you fix your heart on? Even down to this, what do you, what do you turn on the radio in the morning? You know, maybe it's nothing. I like to ride in silence in my vehicle um, for whatever reason. I'm, I'm not in it very long um, each day, and I don't turn on the radio very much. Um, but what are, you, what, are you, what are you pouring into yourself in the morning? What are you listening to? What are you hearing? What are you spending your time doing? Because it's going to set the tone for your entire day. So he did it early in the morning. Also notice in Mark 135, it's on the screen as well, that he got up. He was intentional about his time. When Jesus went to bed the night before, he did so knowing that in the morning, I'm going to get up and spend time with God. It wasn't, well, I finally woke up, so now I'm going to run off and, and spend time with God. No, no, no. He knew. He knew when he went to sleep. Man, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I'm going to do is spend time with the Father. He was intentional about spending that time with him. So my question to you this morning is, do you have a plan to spend time with the Father? Because if not, guess what? It's not going to happen. It's not, I know I'm only 27, 28, 27. Yeah, I'll be 28 here in just a little bit. I I'm know I'm, no, I'm only 27. But in 27 years, or really rather in the last six or seven years, I've learned very well. If I don't have a plan to spend time with God, it's not going to happen. Because there are a million other things that can come up. When I get home from church today, um, I know that I want to relax, I want to sit down, and I want to rest, but I also know there are dishes in my sink, and if I don't have a plan to do those when I get home, what am I going to do? Sit in the recliner and rest, and if I'm just being honest with you, I'm probably going to sit in the recliner and rest anyways, even though I know there are dirty dishes, but when it comes to God time, we must be intentional about spending time with the Father. Don't let it just be something you do whenever you have time. Whenever you have time for, for, for your creator. Jesus also, we see in Mark 35, he left the house and he went away to a secluded place. Jesus spent time with the Father without distraction and alone. He left the house because the house was a place, the, it was a center of activity. There were a lot of things going on in the house. There were people there, others were getting up, maybe others wanted to chat. He was Jesus after all, he was pretty popular, folks wanted to have conversations with him. He went away to a secluded place. We should do the same things as followers of Jesus. 
Listen to that. Followers of Jesus were going to do what he does, and Jesus went away where there was no distraction. He didn't go away to a church. He didn't go away to a small group. He didn't go away with his best friend. He didn't go away, not that he was married, but he didn't go away with his wife or a significant other. That's not what God time's about. It's not that there's a certain time and place for you and your spouse to, to spend time with the Father, for you and your kids to spend time with the Father. But there's also things that God wants to share just with you, just with you through His Word. So are you finding that time without distraction and alone to go and spend with God the Father? A.W. Tozer says it this way, The simplicity which is in Christ is rarely found among us. In its stead are programs, methods, organizations, and a world of nervous activities which occupy time and attention but can never satisfy the longing of the heart. I see this in a lot of churches. The churches that I've worked at too. They will program you to death, have activities to death. And you say, how is this, when you say, how, how is this program or activity, how is this event pointing people more towards Jesus? Well, we're going to, you know, we're going to draw people in and, and we're gonna, they're going to get to hang around with other Jesus followers. No, no, no. Jesus is saying, hey, I spent time with the Father alone, not with anybody. It wasn't about a group or an activity. We activity ourselves to death and program ourselves to death when it's really all about spending time with the Father. And when that begins to happen, boy, everything else just falls into place. Everything else lines up. The church grows. People are saved. It's incredible what happens when God's people simply rely on God, when they go back to Him. So Jesus also spent time with the Father so that the Father could accomplish His mission, could accomplish His purpose through Him. Everything Jesus did, He did out of the overflow of His intimacy with the Father. John 14.10 says this, Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his work. And the same thing is true for you and I, that everything God desires to do in and through my life, he's going to do out of the overflow of my love relationship with him. So, did you catch that? Everything, everything that God wants to do in your life is going to be accomplished out of the overflow of your love relationship with Him, which includes the time that you spend with Him. You want to see the plan that God has for your life? Start spending time with Him. Start spending time with Him. You know what? I'm a sending pastor, so I'm a church planner. My sending pastor's name is John Jenkins. And John and I, have, have, we, we collaborate, we talk together about what this plant is going to look like, some of the steps that we're going to take when we get on the ground in Phoenix. But guess what happens if I never talk to John about what we're going to do on the ground in Phoenix? I don't have a clue what he's thinking. I don't have a clue if I'm going to do it totally different than, than he, you know, expected. Or maybe he has some wisdom to pass along to me, some warnings. He's been a pastor a long time. And if I don't spend time and talk with him, I have no idea. The same is true with God. You want to find out what he wants to do with your life, all the things he has for you to accomplish here on this earth, spend time with him. Spend time with God the Father. So, how do I spend time alone daily with God in fellowship? Why do I do that? Um, and how do I do that? The first thing that you do is you establish a proper goal. Um, you have to establish the goal. The goal being to know God more by spending time with Him. The primary way to accomplish this is through His Word. Everything that God has to say to you is in the Bible. It's right there. It's there for, you, for, for your taking, for your reading. It's incredible when we say, I just don't know what to do in this situation, or life has thrown me this or that, and I just don't know what to do. It's all in His Word. I mean, He addresses everything. Everything He has to say about you, everything He wants to do through you is all in His Word. And the goal is not to become some biblical, biblical mastermind or to, to be a theologian or to read, not even read through the Bible in a year, but just spend time with Him. Set a goal that every day you're going to get in the Word. You know what, some days I read a chapter, some days I read multiple chapters, some days I don't make it two or three verses. Because God begins, excuse me, God begins to speak in just a few verses. So it's not about the amount that you read, it's about the fact that you simply read. Not qual uh, quantity, but quality. Um, so spend time in the Word with God. So we do it by establishing a goal, we do it by preparing our hearts not just rushing into it because tomorrow morning you think, well, Chris said yesterday I need to spend time with God, so I'm going to run in here and read a few verses real quick because he said sometimes he just reads two or three. So that's what I'm going to do this morning, and then I'm out the door. No, no, no. Prepare your heart. Before you read the Word, sit down and spend time in prayer. 
talk to him. Hey, God, and I'm about to dig into your word to me. The word that you breathed. I'm about to dig in. God, speak to me. God, show me. Take me where I need to go. God, speak to my heart today through the passage that I'm going to read. Psalm 119, verse 18 says this. Open my eyes, that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Open my eyes, that I may behold wonderful things from your law. There's your prayer for the morning. There's your prayer before your God time. God, open my eyes, that I may behold, that I may experience the wonderful and beautiful things from your word. Have faith that his presence is going to be there with you. Have faith that you will be in his presence when you're spending time with him. R.A. Torrey said that you don't have to conjure up the presence of God. We don't have to perform a little dance. We don't have to perform a, a, a seance. We don't have to do any kind of, you don't have to have certain candles or smoke or anything. You don't have to conjure up the presence of God. Have faith that you're in his presence. He's omnipresent. So where you are, there he is also. Follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is alive inside of you. It takes time to focus on the Lord. It takes time to focus. So you've got to have patience. But know that if you'll set the goal, and then if you'll be patient and not rush in, just go in with a tender heart, with open ears, say, God, speak to me this morning, that he will speak. And then when you're there, when you're in his presence, and when you're reading his words, enjoy it. Enjoy. If there's a promise, claim it. If there's a question, hey, ask it. If there's a sin, confess it. And you know what? If, if, if there's a command, submit to it. Enjoy His presence. I, 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 don't, I don't know the number. Maybe Pastor Don does. Of how many promises are in God's Word to us? How many things that God promises us? But all throughout Scripture, you read promises. And I had a conversation with a friend the other day, and, and she told me, she said, you know, I read these promises, and sometimes I wonder, like, could that be for me? That promise, because that's really awesome. The answer is yes. Yes. All of God's promises exist for me and they exist for you. And so when you see God's promise that he'll never leave you or forsake you, or as Isaiah 54.10 says, when the mountains move and the hills disappear, even then my covenant of peace will never be broken. So when your whole life is wrecked and nothing looks like it used to look, the whole, the whole scene, all the scenery is different. My covenant of peace is still with you. That's a promise that you can claim. And guess what? I've claimed that in my life in the last five months. I'm so excited about what God's going to do through a church plant. But let me tell you, it's been hard. I'm single. It's been hard to live alone for five months in a brand new place. Not because people don't want to be my friend, because yes, they do want to be my friend, but people here, they have lives. And they have wives and kids and they have friends. And so, so for me, it's been not, not necessarily a lonely five months, but a five months where I've had to claim that. God, the, the mountains have moved, all right, and the hills have disappeared. It is flat here except for the mountains, right? But your covenant of peace with me is not broken. That's just a promise that I've claimed. So when you find a, a, a promise in Scripture, man, claim it over your life. In Jesus' name, claim it and live it out. Clyde Cranford again says this, For the Christian, his entire life uh, is, is to be an intimate walk with God. But that intimacy is developed one day at a time as he sets aside each day some increment of time exclusively for communion with his God. There is no substitute for this time. This is where intimacy begins. So the first way, the first part of your, of your GPS, your roadmap, is God time. And spending time with God. I know this says 5% life and there's numbers. And if you don't know what that's about, I'm going to walk through it at the end when we cover all four. But number one, God time. The second is gather time. Gather time. This is time spent weekly gathering in worship with your church. So let me show you an example of, of Christ doing this in Scripture. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he, Jesus, he came to Nazareth, where he had uh, been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. The scene here is Jesus, he's, he's entered into the synagogue where they're gathered, God's people are gathered to worship. And this is where we find God's people doing what they did before the resurrection. If you look in the Gospels before the resurrection of Jesus, this is what they did. They gathered in the synagogue to worship. It's simply what they did. This was a pattern of Jesus' life to gather with God's people in the synagogue on the Lord's day to worship. This is what Jesus himself did. This practice of Jesus became the pattern of the early church after the resurrection. 
So you see how that works? Before the resurrection, Jesus is here. Jesus joins them, gathers with them. Then Jesus ascends. He's resurrected. And now what happens? The early church says, you know what? Hey, Jesus thought this was a good idea. Let's keep doing it. Let's keep gathering together. Let's keep reading the word. Let's keep worshiping together. Acts 20 verse 7 says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. This is a picture of what happened. After the resurrection, the church still met together, and the apostles, they taught. The men of God, they taught. And the people of God came together, and they worshiped, and they studied, and they grew in the relationship with Jesus. So when we gather for worship, we're not doing some, you know, simply Americanized way of church. We're following a biblical model from the early church in their footsteps and giving priority to public worship of God with God's family. That's why we gather. It's biblical. It's in the book of Acts. So when we gather, what happens? What happens when we gather? Why do we gather? Number one, because, we, because God is worthy of our worship. We gather because he is worthy of our worship. I'm going to show you scripture here in Psalm 95. I'm going to show you verses 1 through 3 and verses 6 through 7. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God.